illuminate her world, making the world with all its signatures visible. Published in 1976, poem, white page, white page, poem, embodies her poetic method. Here is how her poems have been taking form throughout her life, pulsing from her body and lighting her understanding. I'm going to click on this meeting is being recorded so that I can continue. Okay. Poem, white page, white page, poem. Something is streaming out of a body in waves. Something is beginning from the fingertips. They are starting to declare for my whole life. All the despair and the making music, something like wave after wave that breaks on a beach, something like bringing the entire life to this moment, the small waves bringing themselves to white paper. Something like light stands up and is alive. And in Double Ode, also published in 1976, she writes, moving toward new form I am, carry again all the old gifts and wars, black parental mysteries groan and mingle in the night. Something will be born of this. There is no guardian. It is all built into me. Do I move toward form? Do I use all my fears? By fearlessly moving toward one's own form, we can save ourselves and our country, which is afflicted with a mindless comfort, as she writes in Body of Waking, published in 1958. Ruddy we are, strong we are, and insane. We eat very well. We keep the pictures on. We are careful to flush the toilet. Of course, we take exercise. But we're not doomed to this sleepwalking if we seek our genuine form, inspired by seekers who came before us. The force that split the spirit could found a city, that held the split could shine the light of science. This rigid energy could still break and run dancing over the Rockies and Smokies of all lives. Seeking as we began to grow and resting without distrust, we moved toward a requirement still unknown. We spoke of the heroes, the generous ones who gave their meanings. Readers of poetry in the 1950s would surely have recognized the rhythm of Rukeyser's line. The force that split the spirit could found a city. As echoing lines that made Dylan Thomas famous, the notoriously self-destructive poet died in New York in a hospital in 1953 at age 39 following a drinking bout. Here is Thomas. The force that through the green fuse drives the flower, drives my green age. That blasts the roots of trees is my destroyer. And I am dumb to tell the crooked rose, my youth is bent by the same wintry fever. Here, Rukeyser again. The force that split the spirit could found a city that held the split could shine the light of science. Thomas's poem dwells on, even celebrates the force that propels all life to its destruction, to death. It's a paean to entropy. Rukeyser's vision expressed in that recognizable rhythm is instead progressive, embracing the challenges of the present and moving with hope in potential to a future where the energy of seeking, the desire to find resolution may in fact find a new form, a requirement still unknown. But in acknowledging potential, Rukeyser does not minimize suffering. Both the fourth elegy, the refugees, 
an eighth elegy, children's elegy, sing the suffering of the thousands of refugee children of the Spanish War and of World War II. Some of those children were also forced to fight in Spain. These children soldiers, 17-year-olds, uprooted from their families, were completely untrained for fighting. They had to bring their own clothes, even shoes, some fighting in their espadrilles. Many died of typhoid. Here, Rukeyser, cut, frozen and cut, off at the ankle, off at the hip, off at the knee, cut off, crossing the mountains, many died of cold. Because for Rukeyser, the political has always been personal. She identifies with the hurt children of these elegies. The refugee child is also Muriel, as well as the artist seeking an authentic voice for her times. And the child sitting alone planning her hope, I want to write for my race, but what race will you speak being American? I want to write for the living. Again, it's her I want, I want. But the artist seeking that authentic voice is not welcome. Many are cast out, become artists at rejection. In the countries of the mind, cut off at the knee, cut off at the armpit, cut off at the throat. Muriel is the rejected child, the refugee, the artist, cut off from her parents and family, from her fellow revolutionaries in Spain, and from the dominant literary scene in the US, where her poem, Wake Island, was derided in a 1943 review titled, Grandeur and Misery of a Poster Girl. It is her refugee status that binds her to the refugee children of wars, the culture wars, and the wars on battlefields. Desdichada, published in 1973, affirms her personal connection to all child refugees, to rejected children and rejected artists, and her consequent turn to acknowledging every human being. For that you never acknowledged me, I acknowledge the spring's yellow detail, the every drop of rain. Disinherited, annulled, and finally disacknowledged, and all of my own making. I keep that wild dimension of life and making and the spasm upon my mouth as I say this word of acknowledge to you forever. Avig. Then I do take you, but far under consciousness, knowing that under, under flows a river wanting the other. To let this child find, to let men and women find, knowing the seeds in us all. They do say, find. More Clues, also published in 1973, traces her sense of abandonment to her childhood. Mother, because you never spoke to me, I go my life, do I, searching in women's faces, the lost word, a word in the shape of a breast. Father, because both of you never touched me, do I search for men building space on space? There was no touch, both my hands bandaged close. I come from that, but I come far to touch, to word. Muriel survives as do the refugee children and poets who trust in the word, in potential. From the fourth elegy, a line of shadowy children issues, surf issues it, sickness boiled in their flesh, but they are whole. Insular strength surrounds them, hunger feeds them strong. The ripened sun finds them, they are the first of the world, free of the ferryman nostalgia 
who stares at the backward shore, growing free of the old in their slow growth of death. The eighth elegy, children's elegy, while continuing to detail the agonies of refugees is also hopeful. The child recognizes that the darkness comes out of the person. The child fights this darkness. The shadow in us sings, stand out of the light, but I live, I live, I travel in the sun. The sense of abandonment of the children in this elegy is harrowing, as is the poet's identification with the suffering children. War means to me, sings a small skeleton, only the separation, mother no good and gone, taken away in lines of fire and foam. I search to learn the way out of childhood. I need to fight. I wish, I wish for home. The children were broken off from love. However long we were loved, it was not long enough. It is not only the children of these war times, it is also the poet. I see it pass before me in parade, my entire life as a procession of images. And she claims her life. I begin to have what happened to me. She claims it with love. I wanted to die. The masks and the alone seem the whole world and all the gods at war and all the people dead and depraved. Today, the constellation and the music, love. She finally urges herself and her readers to find themselves in creative openness to the world and its meanings. You who seeking yourself arrive at these lines, look once and you see the world, look twice and you see yourself and all the children moving in their change to have what has happened, the pattern and the shock and all of them walk out of their childhood give to you one blue look. This is the meaning of the lines in the fourth elegy. It is the children's voyage must be done before the refugees come home again. In Rukeyser's vision, to reach personal and artistic maturity, one must reclaim the child's urgent, instinctive desire for growth. It is in the fifth elegy, A Turning Wind, that the child and the poet, poet voyage, roaming the country in search of that America she wants to give voice to. Remember the fourth elegy, I want to write for my race, but what race will you speak being American? I want to write for the living. Now from the fifth elegy, she is knowing the shape of the country, knowing the midway travels of migrant fanatics, living that life up with the dawn and moving as long as the light lasts. And when the sun is falling to wait still standing. And when the black has come at last lie down too tired to turn to each other, feeling only the land's demand under them. The poet sings the unique shape of America, torn off from sympathy with the past and planted a primitive streak prefiguring the West, an ideal which had to be modified for stability to make it work. Following the form of the country, she is also describing her own journey where apparently she once prayed to be relieved of her strong desire. Years of night walking in stranger cities, re-lost and unnamed, recurrent familiar rooms furnished only with nightmare, recurrent loves, the glass eye of unreal ambition, churches where you betray yourself 
prey ended desire, white wooden houses of village squares, always one gesture, rejecting of backdrops. She's on a plane, a seeker of the meanings in the scenes she gazes down upon. The tilted cities of America, fields of metal, the seamless wheat fields, the current of cities running below our wings, promise that knowledge of systems which may bless, may permit knowledge of self, this hope of travel to find the place again, rest in the triumphs of the reconceived, lie down again together face to face. In Searching, Not Searching, published more than 40 years later in 1973, she avows she has been a, a lifelong seeker. What kind of woman goes searching and searching among the furrows of dark April along the sea beach, in the faces of children in what they could not tell, in the pages of centuries, for what man, for what magic, in corridors under the earth, in castles of the north, among the blackened miners, among the old, I have gone searching, finding and finding in glimpses. What she wants in searching is to discover, to live at the edge of things, to fall out of routine into invention and recognize at the other edge of ocean, a new kind of man, a new kind of woman walking toward me into the little surf. This is the next me and the next child. Daybreak in continual creation. And in us, our need, the tr traces of the future, the egg and its becoming. The sixth elegy, River Elegy, dated summer 1940, presents images in which we recognize the totalitarian forces building momentum in Europe. It is hell's entropy at work and torment general, but the poet fights the entropy of chaos and despair. It's the imagination again that can light the way. It's our screaming and broken crying against the waste of human cruelty. It's the heart's strong desire, which paradoxically in defeat is sure and magnificent. Terror, war, terror, black blood and wasted love, the most terrible country in the heads of men. This is the war imagination made. It must be strong enough to make a peace. There is no solution. There is no happiness. Only the range must be taken. A way be found to use the inmost frenzy and the outer doom. Century screaming for, for the flowing, the life, the intellectual leap of waters over a world grown old and wild. A broken crying for seasonal change until Oh God, my love, the waste become the sure, magnificent music of the defeated heart. In the seventh elegy, dream singing elegy, she can imagine the world achieving transformation through the strong desire and common dream of humankind. I want is here imagined as we want, as the poem embodies indigenous rituals of dance and singing. In the summer, dreaming was common to all of us. The drumbeat hope, the bursting heart of wish, music to bind us as the visions streamed and midnight brightened to belief. In the morning, we told our dreams. They all were the same dream. The images reach a crescendo of hope. Brothers in dream, beaten and beaten and rising from defeat, 
love and child and brother living, resisting, and the world, one world, dreaming together. But before the hallelujah of the last elegy, enjoy, Rukeyser writes the ninth, the antagonists, where she is conflicted in herself, a gallery of lives fighting within me and all unreconciled, mirroring the conflicts in the country. Our ancestors, all antagonists, slave and conquistador, our America of contradictions. But it is the path we must travel as a nation, form developing American out of conflict. There is an urge to unity among all our oppositions. We are bound by the deepest feuds to unity, to make the connections and be born again, create the creative that will love the world. Love must imagine the world, the wish of love moving upon the body of love describes closing of conflict, repeats the sacred waves in which the spirit dances and survives. Today we are bound for freedom binds us. We live out the conflict of our time until love finding all the antagonists in the dance, moved by its moods and given to its grace resolves the doom and the deliverance. In Despisals, published more than 20 years later in 1973, Rukeyser again voices her desire for unity, recalling the gallery of lives fighting within me of the Ninth Elegy, but in language much more common and startling. In the human cities, never again to despise the backside of the city, the ghetto. You are the city. She enumerates the targets of our usual antagonisms, oppositions, and despisals. Jews, that is ourselves, blacks, homosexuals, the clitoris, the useful shit, the asshole. Where in poetry can be found lines of such plain, raw speech as these? You are this, she writes. Never to despise in myself what I have been taught to despise. Not to despise the other. Not to despise the it. To make this relation with the it. To know that I am it. Finally, in the 10th elegy, Elegy in Joy, she exalts in the vision of reconciliation and peace that she has earned by facing and imagining beyond the horrors she and the world have lived through. Now green, now burning, I make a way for peace. The poet is the maker of this vision. Repeating phrases from earlier elegies, in the triumph of the reconceived, we can lie down at last together, face to face. Many wishes flaming together have brought us to this place. But the work is just beginning. The word of nourishment passes through the women. Nourish beginnings. Let us nourish beginnings. Not all things are blessed but the seeds of all things are blessed. The blessing is in the seed. In 1973, in the simple poem, Wherever, from Breaking Open, she reprises her themes from the 10th elegy. The poet with faith in potential is maker and seeder of a future of justice and peace. Wherever we walk, we will make. Wherever we protest, we will go planting. Make poems, seed grass, feed a child growing. Whatever we stand against, we will stand feeding and seeding. Wherever I walk, I will make.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Louise. It's just also marvelous to hear Rukhaiser's poetry in your voice. That's a beautiful reading of it. Uh, so the question and answer is now open. Uh, as you know, attendees cannot uh, pose questions and you couldn't, but some of the panelists can unmute themselves uh, while the question and answers are coming in. And, and uh, if you have questions of your own, uh, you are welcome to chime in. Um, and uh, maybe we have some immediate ones. Um, there is a question and answer coming in. It's from Clive Bush. Thank oh, Clive Bush. Marvelous. You let her voice be heard. Yes. <laughs> that is so powerful. Thank uh, you. Yes. Oh. So 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 powerful uh, anybody else and it says rob halpern that was an exquisite talk gratitude uh, rob halpern is one of my colleagues um it's very lovely um you know louise when trudy and first and i first went to see you you talked about how incredible it was uh, Rukhaiser's idea of antagonism and creative mm -hmm. antagonism. I think you had read a book even and when you wrote your book of, you know, creative antagonism. And I was so struck by that because I don't think we have enough positive models of huh. creative antagonism. Our antagonisms tend, uh, tend to calcify. Right. And you know, I asked my students what they thought. We are bound by the deepest feuds to unity. <laughs> Our antagonisms actually bind us, you know. And uh, yeah, hmm. Dennis, Dennis, you want to chime in on yeah. that? Yes. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Louise, I, I, I want to ask you, do you remember when you first heard about Muriel? And what was the when was the first time you saw her and and you know and talk a little bit about this? She wasn't she was an incredible writer, but she was also an orator. She could deliver her work. Some people can put it on the page, but they can't get it out. Could you talk about sort of when you saw her and just about that part of her work and well, her power? I I never did hear her deliver her poetry. Uh, I, I heard her speak only when she called me on the telephone after receiving my letter saying, I'd like to write a book about you if no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she was, so, she was so open and wonderful, you know. That's the first time I heard her voice when she called yes. me back. Um, as for when I first heard about her, I had a friend who had read the Ballad of Orange and Grape. Um, and uh, I think that's the first I heard of her. And I started to read and I, I, I was amazed that I couldn't find, you know, I was, I was a, a budding scholar and I was amazed that I couldn't find any scholarship about her. Um, so I, I started to read and what I read was the reviews and I was horrified, you know. <laughs> Uh, the reviews were so negative and um, sexist and belittling, disparaging. Um, there, were, there were some who appreciated, there was uh, M.L. Rosenthal, his dissertation, um, but uh, Louise Bogan and, um, and, uh, people like that. I mean, I just, I just found it remarkable. So then I began to read and I began to, to talk to her to correspond. Um, uh, in, in typewritten letters. <laughs> um, 
And she would always, she would answer by either calling me back or, or writing to me in that beautiful handwriting she had. Uh, my correspondence with her is, is in, the, in the archives and she kept that writing pretty much toward the end of her life. After a while, it got pretty shaky, but um, yeah. Louise, I was thinking that you got your draft of the book to her just before she died? Just that... before. It was being read to her by someone who was uh, assisting, assisting her uh, in her last illness. And I can't remember the name, but you do, Elizabeth, because you recognize that name. Yeah, Jan. that was Jan Hella Levy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Jan Hella Levy. We have the, this little edition of the allergies, uh, thanks to Jan Hella and oh. Chris Hella. Um, you know, they, they edited it. Yes, yes. Um, so there is, yeah, there is uh, some comments uh, and we get more in the chat. I think the chat feels a little, you know, more informal. Um, you know, somebody says, sorry to have missed the very beginning of this, but I very much enjoyed this reading of Rukaisa's poetry across her lifetime. So often we encounter poetry as a single unit and hear a body of work, a lifetime, a life. Um, I think that's just a marvelous comment. Um, and, uh, but the scholarship seems to only focus on certain of her poems and very rarely actually look at the entire poetic work because even though you show there was a real um, continuity of themes, her aesthetics would change it's interesting that she wrote allergies probably shortly after, or maybe even still simultaneously to Book of the Dead, which has a documentary aesthetic, which mm -hmm. the 90s has drawn all the attention. She wrote, um, and then she has these very visionary allergies, which you would not call documentary, even though in the child children's allergy, she does include what you might well con what you could call documentary material from Anna Freud's uh, book on war nurseries that Clive Bush uh, made that important connection to us. Yeah. So here's another uh, comment from Susan Abbott. Thank you, Louise. So good to hear and see you and how Mur Muriel infuses and enthusiasts enthusiasts you and us through you. I had a very similar experience, amazed how little she was known when I learned of her in 1979. Mm -hmm. She served a Nobel Prize and then she died. I spent many hours in the Burke collection in the 1980s. So this is a, this, this is certainly something uh, I am of a younger, a little bit generation, but certainly I never encountered her in a classroom. Mm -hmm. I talk to my students, they have not encountered her in any of their collections or actually in previous classes, except now some it, uh, it's, it's been taught. Um, I know that somebody was interested in the question on creative <laughs> antagonism. I don't know whether we want to return to that briefly. I think it's a steep task. Uh, I don't you know, how do we uh, enliven creative antagonism and maybe what can poetry teach us about creative antagonism? I don't know whether you have any thoughts about that, Louise. Oh. Well, if, if, you, if you could get the antagonists in the same room <laughs> hearing poetry, maybe something would happen. But um, I don't know, you, you, you put it well. I mean, our antagonists, our antagonism seem to have calcified mm -hmm. um. yeah 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 that is uh, that is a real problem here's a question from Lucas Mo to all panelists I have a question for Bill Rukeyser I'm curious what Muriel said about her teaching work did she think of herself as a teacher as well as a poet you know, I don't think that she uh, saw those as contradictory at all. Uh, honestly, 
part of uh, her going into teaching was what I referred to when I was talking about the uh, the changes in her life uh, after she decided to have a child. Uh, you know, she she got hit with financial obligations, mm -hmm. uh, the need to stay in one place for longer than she had been used to. If you take a look at her her life in the 30s and uh, the first half of the 40s, she was moving around uh, an awful lot. You know, we tend to take for granted the fact that people are going to be quite mobile now. Uh, that was certainly not the, the standard issue back then. And uh, she traveled light uh, up until 1947. Uh, she was rarely in one place for uh, for a whole long time. Uh, things changed dramatically. Uh, you know, she taught at the uh, the San Francisco Labor School uh, in the late '40s. Uh, that was hardly remunerative, uh, but uh, you know, it it helped a bit. Uh, she had a series of lectures at Vassar. Uh, obviously. Uh, it was very good for her uh, getting a, a gig, although it was a part-time gig at Sarah Lawrence in the 50s and early 60s. Uh, but, you know, part of it was, frankly, earning a living. Uh, part of it was uh, the rewards that came from uh, engaged and uh, challenging students, uh, you know, she really appreciated the uh, technique at Sarah Lawrence, the small seminars, uh, working one-on-one -on -one with students, uh, but it, it was a real uh, challenge continuing to be a working writer and uh, doing the the heavy lifting that was involved using the the Sarah Lawrence uh, technique at that time, uh, I think to a large extent it was was exhausting, and her output during the fifties, uh, I'm sure, would have been far greater had she not been teaching. How that balances out, you know, I think for her it was a positive. I think that she got a lot of. Uh, feedback and input from students. She appreciated teaching, but just in terms of uh, what might have been written had she not been doing that. Ostensibly, it was a part-time job. It absorbed a lot of time. And I can remember in the late 50s, uh, she would be working uh, at her work table. It was actually uh, a door that had been set up on a couple of file cabinets uh, with piles of paper, uh, you know, drafts, either in longhand or with a typewriter. But uh, a lot of that work was done late at night. Uh, and that was an indication of the fact that she had a day job and a night job. Yeah, she she said to me once, one of the most impractical things is to be a poet and a part-time teacher. She found that impractical, she said. True. <laughs> and and of course, after her first stroke, uh, at that point, she uh, stopped working at Sarah Lawrence and uh, did readings and lectures, things like that. I think she still thought of herself to a certain extent. As, a, as teaching, but she was no longer doing, you know, one or two classes a year. Well, thank you for these questions and comments. Uh, we are now at 12.16 and we wanted to have our coffee break at 12.30. And so while you're thinking of maybe additional questions, you know, we're gonna have a informal conversation with uh, Louise at the very end on Saturday 
um, after we've had all, we've listened to all the presentations and certainly let us take notes of questions we have. We might, we will have a chance to ask them in other contexts. Um, so Casey, would you uh, put up the link to the coffee hour, which takes place, yes, in a different Zoom. I am the host of that. So this is a live link. If you want to join, I would suggest that you join. If you have the book, any version of allergies, get ready to read. Um, maybe you would just enjoy listening. Uh, we could also, through share screen, make some of these allergies uh, available. Um, but just remember um, that, yes, Thank you, Louise, for kicking off this event. You get a lot of virtual applause here, Louise. Thank you. Yes. Just Thanks, remember sir. that the URL you use to get in the webinar is, is always available to you. So as you go to the Zoom events, just leave this one. You know, uh, this one will stay as this virtual room and outer space for us <laughs> until tomorrow. Um, let me know if there are any other questions at this point. Um, Elizabeth, we, we did have uh, two questions that okay. were posted okay, in there, which um, I think there's there's two options. Um, okay. We can either talk about them now or, or take the opportunity to say we'll have another opportunity um, informally or at yes. another point to talk. Yes, about and we responded to Clive, so this is from Eulalia, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Wonderful from Spain. Isn't there a life beyond those antagonists? That's her I want and the overcoming of any war. If you look at the world twice, you see yourself. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that she doesn't imagine the antagonism being forever. I also wanted to highlight that Lenora Gerstein had a question. Um, yes. I think it's a big question. Is it possible that some of the rejection of Rukhaiser in the 40s and 50s had a purely political motivation? Oh, um, is it possible that the right wing anti communist establishment behind the scenes had a lot to do with this? Um, so I'll put that out there. I don't know if folks want to go into it now or if there's an opportunity later to return to this question. It seems like a pretty big and important one. Mm -hmm. I am very certain that we'll return to this. The panelists mm -hmm. will bring it up. And uh, so we will we'll definitely have a chance to return to that question. It is indeed a big question. It's also one that Rowena Kennedy Epstein will address that Eric Keenan addresses that mm -hmm. now careless will address uh, that probably Lucas Moe will address. So it is the uh, very important question. Uh, aesthetics and politics uh, going very much hand in hand and if you agree with me, Louise, on this and, and you and Rukhaiser being mm -hmm. aware of that. Yeah. I agree, but but when someone like Robert Lowell um, disparages um, Rukhaiser, I don't know if it's political. Maybe it is. Uh, I didn't I didn't think of it. Yeah. So it could also be mm -hmm. yeah there was some sometimes uh, ad hominem uh, personal and yeah, often. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, let's all take a little break. And let's hope we all see each other in the coffee break. <laughs>